This is the home of free speech, of course, and a fantastic online newspaper is similarly uh, unregulated, unpasteurized and refreshingly honest. It always shoots from the hip and it's spiked online. Its editor, Brendan O'Neill, joins me now. Hi, Brendan. Hi, how's it going? Really good. Fantastic to have you on the show. Well, a big day for the country. We are knee deep, unfortunately, in this pandemic with no end in sight. Uh, however, it is the start of a new year and it's impossible to not feel some sense of a positive vibe, given the fact that the Brexit issue has been resolved. 2021 is a year in which we don't have to worry about the ERG and about <laughs> Brexiteers and Remainers, and we can actually all get on with our lives. Yeah, I, I am delighted. I, I'm a hardcore Brexiteer. I'm one of those people who thinks that leaving the European Union is a fantastic idea. The European Union, in my view, is a neoliberal, anti-working class, anti-democratic oligarchy. Just look at what it did to the people of Greece. Look at the, what it did to the people of Ireland when it effectively took over Ireland in 2010 and enforced austerity. Or just look at the way it overrode votes in France, the Netherlands and other places. If anyone ever votes against the European Union, they just get ignored, trampled over, and the European Union does what it wants to do anyway. This is a poisonous institution. I think it's wonderful that Britain is no longer part of it. And I, I think it's a very positive vibe. Even in this era of pandemic and lockdowns, I think we should celebrate the fact that Britain has struck out on its own and become a more democratic nation. Uh, but also, we've been credited uh, here in the UK as the agitators on, on this one in relationship to, you know, our, our history with the EU and our decision to leave. But actually, a lot of this is self-authored by the EU, given the fact that David Cameron went to Brussels, went to Angela Merkel uh, and others with his begging bowl out, and he sought concessions with which to sell continued EU membership to the British people. And if the EU had given him a little more to come home with than thin gruel, we might still be in. I think that's one of the key points. The EU is unreformable. I mean, that's what's become very clear in recent years. That's what became very clear from David Cameron's failure to win any significant concessions from the European Union. And that's what's become clear in other countries' clashes with the European Union as well. You know, at the moment, Hungary and Poland are constantly tussling with the European Union because the EU effectively wants to force those countries to rewrite their legal systems, rewrite their political priorities, to suit the tastes of Brussels rather than the tastes of the people of Hungary and Poland. The EU doesn't back down. You know, it's it's a it's a fairly tyrannical institution at times, and it will ride roughshod over anyone who disagrees with it. So the only way to have a good deal with the European Union, in my view, is to be outside of it. But the other reason it's really worth celebrating today is also, of course, because so many people here in the UK said this would never happen. They said it was impossible to leave the European Union. It was too complicated. We would never get a trade deal. None of this will work. It will be a disaster. We'll all be starving to death and we'll be lacking basic medicines. I mean, the project fear of the past four and a half years has been absolutely out of control. So we've also proven those people wrong, I think. And I predict things will go relatively smoothly uh, now that we've left. Of course, there'll be bumps in the road. There always are when you take a new direction. But I think we will prove the naysayers, the anti-democratics, the, the anti-democrats and the Ramonas. I think we will prove them wrong and things will be OK. Also, politically, the timeline is helpful to the prime minister because he's got four years for this uh, recalibration of the British economy and our constitution to bed in. Yes, that's right. And um, I think already he's benefiting from the fact that he's got a trade deal. Um, you know, for me, the most remarkable thing about 2020, which is now thankfully behind us, the most remarkable thing was that even though Boris Johnson was doing unprecedented things in terms of lockdowns, in terms of suspending civil liberties and having a pretty detrimental impact on the economy, we know that we're now heading for one of the worst recessions on record. Even though he did all those things, he still remained fairly high in the polls and was usually above Labour. And that's because, I think, it's because he was saying he would still do Brexit, he would still focus on what the people wanted politically. 
while Labour has just been kind of floundering, it doesn't really know who it represents anymore. It wants to represent the working classes, but they've turned their backs on Labour. And instead, Labour has become, as John Curtis said recently, a thoroughly middle class party. It only excites the middle classes. It no longer excites the working classes. So um, I think as a, as a result of all those shifts that have taken place and all those political realignments, Boris has benefited quite a lot, even in this crazy year. So over the next three or four years, as we get used to being outside of the European Union, I think he could quite easily present this as a great victory. And he's the man who acted on the people's democratic wishes. I think that will be the selling point he pushes for the next few years. However, Brendan, how time limited might this Brexit bounce be? Uh, will those voters in the red wall seats in four years time remember that Brexit was delivered or will they be in the throes of what has been the hangover or will have been the hangover from the Covid measures and a very damaged economy? I think that's a key question. And I think um, uh, quite a few people have made this point that in four years time, what people are most likely to remember is the fact that they lost their job, that they may have lost their house that their high street became a ghost town, all the shops closed down, the pubs closed down. I think people are more likely to remember the detrimental impact of the economic shutdown more than the undoubtedly terrible impact of COVID-19 itself on some people's lives. And I think that's what's going to linger in people's minds because it's going to have a long-term impact. But at the same time, Boris has got the Brexit bounce. I think he will soon get the vaccine bounce. Uh, and, you know, the promise now is that we could be back to normal by Easter, which in my view is too long away, but at least that's what he's promising. So there are two bounces that he will benefit from. I think the question is, after we've done Brexit and after we've rolled out the vaccine, what will Boris really do for those red wall areas? Will he invest heavily in those areas? Will he bring them back to life and treat the people who live there as democratic citizens who enjoy, who ought to enjoy a comfortable life? Will he do that? Or will he just leave them behind like other governments have done in recent decades? So the Brexit bounce will be good for him. The vaccine bounce will be good for him. But the longer term strategy and policy, that's what people will be keeping an eye on. Uh, Brendan, you are a red blooded Brexit here. Must be a day of joy for you in celebration. Um, I am a Remain, or at least I voted to remain in 2016, but I immediately accepted the result. I can't believe that I have to say I accepted the result. It should, <laughs> should be a given that one accepts a result. But uh, that, that is for me how democracy works. And my feeling is... A bit like if a party wins power that I haven't voted for, I think, OK, fine. Well, we've got the Tories now. Or we've got Labour. or We've got the Lib Dems or we've got a coalition. Uh, I'll get behind the project because at this point, you know, when you're on an aeroplane, the captain is the captain, who, whoever uh, whoever has been chosen in relation to politics. So um, do you think that we will discover this year just how much of an emotional, mental and creative drain on the country's resources this Brexit debate has been? Is it going to be the removal of that awful thorn from our side? And there might be just quite a national renewal um, in the absence of this, what felt like an endless debate. I hope so. I'm hoping for a national renewal now that we have put aside these crazy four years in which you know, significant sections of society try to block a democratic vote. I think we still need to have a reckoning with what those people did. Most Remain voters are exactly like you. They, they accepted the result. I get emails from Remain voters all the time saying they really are shocked at what Remain campaigners are doing. And they, they make the point they're not doing this in my name because I accept the democratic result. So I still think we need a reckoning with what was done by sections of the political class, the media elites, the legal system and various other wings of the establishment who actually try to overthrow the largest democratic vote in the history of this country. That needs to be talked about, that needs to be studied, that needs to be analysed. We can't just let that slide into the history books. Uh, so, you know, what's happened over the past four years, I think, there has been relentless negativity, relentless fear-mongering about Brexit. Everyone has said it's, it's the end of the world as we know it. It's terrible. We should never have done it. And I think now that those people have been proven wrong, I hope they will eat some humble pie, recognise that they were absolutely wrong to try to crush the votes of their fellow 
fellow citizens and get back to being normal people. And if they do that, if that wing of the political elite does that and realizes that democracy is important, then I think we could have the kind of renewal you're talking about and people coming together a bit more rather than being really badly divided. Well, I think we have to hope that happens because unfortunately Brexit appears to have created a template for discourse in this country which is very black and white, very tribal. And we've seen it in the COVID-19 pandemic where you've got your lockdown sceptics who are very worried about all of the damaged lives and the other health impacts from the COVID measures. And apparently those people are heartless. They're right wing, apparently. Don't know how that works. And that they're granny killers. And then you sort of have your lockdown cheerleaders who seem oblivious to the economic damage and are focused exclusively on the virus. So, you know, you could argue that Brexit has been replicated during this pandemic in terms of how to deal with it. And it's just terribly important that that's not how we talk to each other in the years to come. I think that's right. And I think what tends to happen these days is that in this era of culture wars, everything becomes a culture war issue very quickly. So everything becomes an issue around which Usually, the usual suspects line up with each other, take a particular position, become quite rigid, don't really think things through, and then just scream at the other side. Now, I'm all in favor of political debate, political conflict, political division. I think these are the ways in which you work out whose interests are more important, what the priorities of the nation should be. So I'm not one of those people who is into consensual, happy, clappy politics. I think that's a bit of a middle class fantasy. But at the same time, if we're going to have political tension, which is inevitable, it should be uh, based in fact, it should be based in genuinely held convictions, and it shouldn't just descend into a ridiculous shouting match all the time. These should be serious, deep, profound discussions. I think one of the problems of the past few years is this tendency to demonize anyone who disagrees with you. So, uh, you know, not only, we don't just say now, oh, I think you're wrong, and here's why I think you're wrong. We say you're evil, you're wicked for holding that political point of view, and I'm going to try and cancel you. If you're a feminist who criticizes aspects of transgenderism, you're written off as evil. If you're someone who criticizes certain aspects of Islam, for example, you're Islamophobic, you have to be shunted out of polite society. Any position which falls outside of the narrow, politically correct mainstream tends to be demonized and hounded. That's a really bad way to conduct public life because we need as many voices as possible in order for us to work out what's the right direction for society to take. Final thought, Brendan. I know you've written extensively at Spiked Online on the culture of wokeism. And actually, I saw a, a post from a fellow comedian. I, I think the world of comedy is is inherently a little left leaning and nothing wrong with that at all. But um, this person sent a post and they they were sort of talking about wokeism and they were saying, isn't isn't that what we're trying to aspire to? Aren't we are we supposed to want to be woke? So can you just explain confusion around the term woke and whether it should be an aspiration? And if not, what's the problem with it? Yeah, I think when people like that say, shouldn't we aspire to be woke? I think they're mixing up wokeness with something else. I think they're mixing up wokeness with the great noble traditions of anti-racism, anti-sexism, the idea that we should live in an equal free society, the kind of ideas that have been pushed for decades by radicals in the 1960s or by Martin Luther King, various other political actors over the years have made the argument that everyone should have equal rights and everyone should be free to speak their minds. I 100% support that idea. But what the politics of wokeness does, it turns those great gains of history on their heads. So now we're not encouraged to judge people by their character rather than their color, which was Martin Luther King's great cry. We're encouraged to obsess about race, to think about race all the time. We have critical race theory in schools and universities, educating a new generation to obsess about race, to obsess about whether someone is black or white. Um, in, in relation to uh, sex, sexism, for example, we're now told that A man can become a woman with a click of his fingers and women have to accept this. They have to accept him into every sphere of their lives, into their changing rooms, into their prisons, into their sports. And I think that's also a reversal of the struggle for women's rights. So the argument I would make is all the great 
liberal campaigns of the past few decades which have liberated minority groups and given women equality to men, all those things which have been, I think, wonderful, they risk being overturned by this cult of wokeness which is re-racializing re everyday life, censoring dissenting opinion, and creating new orthodoxies, which I think are very stifling. Well, the problem is, apart, well, not the opposite of being touchy-feely and groovy and, and all sort of hugs and kisses. It's, it's quite totalitarian, yeah. and it's, it's quite illiberal. Yes, absolutely. So it's nothing like uh, the movements of the 60s, for example, or, or the 70s or the 80s, in fact, when there were many positive... Uh, anti-racist movements and and movements for freedom of speech, the right of artists to express themselves, all these kind of positive movements that took place. It's nothing like that. It is shrill. It is um, often quite hysterical. It's very, very censorious. It wants to clamp down on anyone who disagrees with its orthodoxies. It's, it's more like the old conservative Christian right who used to wave their Bibles and try to censor um, gay films or, or pornographic literature or whatever else it might have been, it has more in common with that section of politics than it does with a kind of left liberal move towards a freer, more equal society. So I think you're right. It has totalitarian tendencies. And that's why I think we shouldn't aspire to be woke. Well, somebody that will never be cancelled is Brendan O'Neill, certainly not on this radio station. He's the editor of the very entertaining Spiked Online, quite a, uh, a remarkable uh, news source uh, packed with opinion and debate. And that's what we always want to have. And I personally always want to hear from both sides because it's much more interesting.